Hello, my name is Tafun Penry. I'm a solitary pagan witch. I'm an author and the founder of the Wolf and Howl Press. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about preparing for the summer solstice. Um, the thing about festivals when you're a solitary is that you very rarely have anyone to celebrate these festivals with. I mean, Christmas time is a bit different. You can make a big door of Yule. But the summer solstice, Litha as it's sometimes called, that's a little bit different. So this little talk is about giving you a few ideas of things you can do. Um, for me, I feel that celebrating is important and there are lots of ways of doing it. Yes, you can get out and go and dance around the field or something, but most of us can't. And we'd feel a bit silly if we did and anybody else saw us. Let's be honest about this. So we have to find ways to celebrate that are authentic and yet also they have something uh, that we can do as solitary. So, forget going to Stonehenge, lovely though it must be. Forget going to your nearest standing stone. What can we do? What is the festival about? Well, the first thing to remember is that uh, the, the power of the sun, if you like, is at its height at this time of year. And uh, that's why the, the, um, the solstice in summer was surprisingly celebrated a lot with bonfires. Uh, they used to make... <laughs> that's Noah shaking himself. He's had enough. Um, they used to make straw wheels, for example, and roll them downhill. Well, you'd probably get yourself into trouble if you did that nowadays. But, I mean, a small straw wheel to, you know, uh, send down a, a little slope in your garden or something. That's possible. That's a possibility, and it is authentic. Why do they do it? Well, you can see the wheel, the turning of the seasons, and the fire showing that the heat of the sun, because without the sun, we are nothing. We would be a cold, lifeless planet. So, that's a start. Um, another thing about the, the bonfires was that they were used a lot for purification. Fire purifies. Um, people would drive their cattle between two bonfires as a sort of ceremonial way of uh, um, purifying them, making sure they were fit and well, that they weren't diseased or enchanted for the rest of the year. Now, we can't light two bonfires, and I doubt whether many people listening to this have um, cattle. Uh, so how would we do it? Well, we could ceremonially walk between two candles. You know, we could put a candle on one table or something like that, or one chair, and a candle on another, and ceremonially walk between it. And you might say, well, that's not a real celebration. But yes, it is, because it's what happens up in here that is really where the magic, the spirituality happens. Here and here, heart and mind. If you feel silly walking between two candles propped on two chairs, you probably are being silly. But if you make something of it in your mind that this is your spiritual cleansing for the second half of the year, it'll work. Take it from me, it will work. Um, fires are not the only things. Uh, it was what you burned on fires too. It was a great time, that the solstice, for burning plants, believe it or not. Um, plants picked at the solstice were um, believed to be extremely powerful. And I think you can probably link this back to the idea that they absorbed the growing of the earth, they grew in the first half of the year, they absorbed the height of the sun, and therefore when you picked them, they were full of all the very best things. So people did several things. They burned them sometimes on bonfires, they uh, kept them and burned them at the winter solstice underneath fruit trees to make them more fertile. Uh, what else did they do? Um, they made belts of the plant mugwort, um, now that has links with the Norse and Anglo-Saxon belief that Thor, or Thunor as he was to the Anglo-Saxons, he wore a belt of mugwort, which probably means it was plaited. He wore um, a belt of mugwort whenever he was undertaking a dangerous journey. So people would wear that on the solstice and then they would burn it in the bonfire at night. Well, a bit ambitious for a solitary perhaps, but certainly... Uh, going out looking for mugwort, planting it in the early part of the year if you if you think that far ahead, and failing that, 
I mean, go and look for a picture of Mugwort, see what it looks like. This is all part of how we build ourselves as solitaries. We build ourselves in any way we can. Now, this is tremendously important. We do what we can and we don't worry about what we can't do. Now, I do have notes here because it's a huge subject, the summer solstice. And I'd like to get it all on one video. What else do I have? Oh, yes. Um, the idea where I said about uh, people would like bonfires, they would leap over things, leap over fires. Um, I'm pretty sure they probably danced as well, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. If they could dance, they would. Dance, feast, mead, you name it, they probably did that. Um, and our word giddy, I think this is lovely, our word giddy comes from the Anglo-Saxon giddig, uh, which meant to uh, connect with a god, to contact a god. So when you become giddy from your dancing, from your exertions, you have in fact connected with a god. I think that's wonderful. It links it very neatly back with things like whirling dervishes in other traditions. I think that's lovely. Um, another thing that's it's curiously affected, uh, associated with the, the solstice is nakedness. Now, it's not the nakedness of uh, going off and having sex in the woods. I'm not talking about that. Uh, but we know quite a bit about how important the solstice was because the early church took it over, they Christianised it, and they made it the Feast of St John. They made it two days later, which I think I mentioned on the solstice poem video, that they often uh, took over a festival, and two days later they made it a Christian festival. So 23rd or 24th, I can't remember, of June is the Feast of St John, which is two days after the solstice, which is usually, but not always, on the 21st of June. Um, and we know quite a bit about what the pagan traditions must have been because the early church uh, couldn't wipe them out very easily. So they issued lots of edicts and uh, published lots of sermons telling people what they were not allowed to do. And of course, from these thou shalt not sermons, uh, we know what people were doing. So, for example, um, we have uh, one warning against people uh, being in springs and rivers, either during the day or the night, um, on the Feast of St John, or near the Feast of St John. So we know, for example, that shows that part of the pagan celebrations of the period, pre-Christian period, was being in the water. And the water seems to be incredibly closely linked with the solstice. Well, obviously, it all depends on where you live, but, you know. Um, and there were others who warned about uh, bathing naked. Uh, and these warnings went on as late in some areas, such as Naples and Italy. They went on as late as 1580. So these beliefs were very deeply entrenched that at the solstice, you went off and bathed naked. Well, obviously, you know, you get into trouble if you went off and bathed naked in Barry Island or wherever is your nearest beach or what have you. But there's nothing sp stopping us as solitaries taking a bath or taking a shower, a special one, perhaps with special herb scented soap or something on that day as part of our celebration of the solstice as a solitary. This is how we adapt things, you see. Um, in the same way women would wander into flax fields. Women and flax were very closely linked. It was believed that only a naked woman could sow flax. And uh, at the time of the solstice, women went out naked all ages. It wasn't a beauty contest. They went out at all ages into flax fields. Now, I don't know about you, but we don't have a flax field near here, so we can't really do it. But you might want to think next year that you will grow a few pots of flax perhaps so that you can use these in your celebrations as a solitary at the summer solstice. What else do I have? Because I have loads here. Um, another thing which was hugely uh, popular was burning nuts. Now I have no idea why. Nuts were associated with fertility. I'm not sure why you would want to burn them unless it was to sort of offer them to the power of the sun. Maybe burning nuts and flowers was a, a replacement for um, sacrifices of animals or even people, I don't know. Um, but it's a much more palatable 
way of doing it that you can burn nuts. You can roast them if you wanted to. Roast them and eat them as part of a solstice meal, something like that. There are lots of things we can do as long as you do it in the right frame of mind. I'm sorry I have to keep leaning over, but my mind is like a sieve today. Um, St John's Wort. Now we said about St John's Day replacing the solstice. Uh, St John's Wort we think of as a specific yellow flower, but actually at one time it was a name given to any flowers that were in bloom around the time of the solstice, the Feast of St John. So anything, marigolds, sunflowers, anything, could accurately be described then as... Sorry about that noise. It's, it's not water for the solstice, it's the washing machine out there. It could accurately be described as St John's Wort. Um, and what else do we have? Um, oh, two things. One is um, that people did a lot of divination around the solstice. Did it around the winter solstice as well. I don't know why, whether it's because perhaps the, the unnatural stretching of day or night means perhaps a more insight into uh, the other side of the world. And like the equinox, which is balanced, uh, there is that real tilt at the time of the solstice. So maybe that makes divination easier and fortune telling. And dowsing is another one that was very popular. And the other one, and this is purely my own observation, two things. One is that shortly after the solstice, we seem to get a period of rain. I always notice that here. Look out for it where you live. You might notice it as well. I always think it's, uh, for me, it's the tears of the goddess as she knows that um, the sun king, the bright lord, whatever you want to call him, the oak king, he is now going to be in decline. He has reached his highest point and now it's a downward slope towards Samhain and the start of winter. So that's one way of looking at it. Look for changes in the weather directly after the summer solstice. And the other one is that uh, I've noticed that around the solstice, you, especially if you get a full moon, you get a terrific buzzing of energy. And uh, it doesn't matter what the moon is this year. This is something for you to note and go and check it every year. But I notice that if the moon is full, uh, you get this terrific crackling of energy. You can almost feel it. Um, you know, Mr. Penry often says the universe is vibrating and uh, our kids all used to laugh at him. But actually, of course, everything is vibrating. Everything is made up of vibrations and energy and electromagnetic fields and things like that. Um, we'd probably be horrified if we knew the half of it. So that's one thing. On a full moon, at the solstice, very strong energies. And if you have the dark of the moon, that period, some people call it the new moon, but I always think of it as the dark of the moon where it just goes black, there is no moon. Um, I have always found it's a time when people get drawn into hexing, like nobody's business. If you notice a time when people's energies are really unpleasant, where you notice a lot of people bad-mouthing each other, say. Um, if you notice a lot of that, a lot of hexing, a lot of unexplained things happening, if you have the dark of the moon at the solstice, it seems as though something which is already tilted is really just doesn't know what to do with itself. So that's something else to look for. Anyway, they're all ideas, they're all things I think you can do quite legally as uh, solitaries and uh, I do hope you enjoy yourselves. So thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.